Ooh. All right, and it looks like, it looks like we are live. So we are here to discuss the song of, oh, hold on, camera angles, the song of Kamaria, specifically in the orbit of Sirens, on the winds of Quasars, and at the threshold of the universe with the author, T.A. Bruno. This guy. this guy, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Uh, I'm T.A. Bruno, or Tom Bruno, uh, and as a Andrew kind of nailed it, I don't really have much else to talk about. <laughs> I wrote three books, and uh, they have names that uh, are long, and there you go. All right, well, we've introduced the book, so it's time to sign off. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, there we go. We're good to go. <laughs> so before we jump into it, uh, I just do want to mention that uh, you do have a Labor Day sale going on yes. for In the Orbit of Sirens, the first book, which is free currently on Kindle Unlimited, I believe internationally. Yes, and uh, uh, yeah, the Kindle edition is free, and it's also on Kindle Unlimited, so if you have Kindle Unlimited, you can... You can get that at any point. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, if you and, want a copy, you get it for free today or this weekend. <laughs> and if uh, you, you do have audiobooks for this series as well, yes. narrated by CJ or Logan. We don't know his name. <laughs> yeah, uh, CJ McAllister. And uh, the third one should be coming out in, like, a few weeks. Uh, okay, I'm so. finalizing it at the moment, and we're kind of running into a little bit of weirdness with uh, the, the website we use to do it. Mm -hmm. um, so we're just getting that resolved. And so far, it's been amazing. Like I've listened to most of it already. Uh, well, so we just provided me a copy of Winds of Quasars. On oh, there you go. Yeah, perfect. And that was that was awesome. That was a fantastic mm. experience. Well, like, <laughs> right, and we've got, of course, Lana excited for the interview. Oh, there we go. So is Kay, and we've got Theo from Rekindled Reader, ah, one of my cool. good buddies. Very nice. And a frequent commenter, Safina. Nice so <laughs> let's let's get that comment down. Okay. So first of all, I kind of want to talk about the covers and the art and everything that went into these physical books sure because that. these books are stunning. <laughs> um, I do have the paperbacks here, and I like the way they feel because you got that nice matte finish. But who oh, did yeah. your cover design, and how did you kind of settle on the art style and oh, the sure. ideas went into the covers? So, uh, and I, I got them here too, so I might as well hold them just like you're doing. <laughs> and so, and uh, so these are in paperback and hardcover. Um, the artist who does the cover art is different from the guy who does the interior art. Uh, Daniel Schmeling does the cover art. He's fantastic. Uh, I found him through the <clears throat> service. If anybody else is a self-pub author out there, um, it's called readsy.com. And uh, they basically, it's like a freelance resource, uh, but high quality for self-pub authors. I found him on there knowing that I wanted to do uh, kind of an old school look to the covers. Uh, you know, it's a painted background. It's kind of epic in scope. It puts you in a scene. Yeah, exactly. All those. And, uh, uh, you know, I found Daniel because he was, he was one of the only guys kind of doing that style. Uh, and so I hired, he was the only guy I, I I won't tell him this because he'll probably upcharge you. <laughs> like, he's the only guy I, I like wanted to hire. I'm like, you have, I have to have you for my books. Uh, and he did a fantastic job. I mean, we're still buddies. Like we talk on Instagram and stuff. And he, he's like, oh, when are you going to write the next one? I'm like, man, I need more ideas. <laughs> <laughs> I need more ideas. So I, can I used make all of my to do more art. <laughs> and so you said somebody else did the interior artworks because yes. each part has kind of a panel. Now I'm only going to show the first one because the rest are kind of spoilers, mm. but uh, each part of a book, and I think this one's got like three or four, one, two, yeah. you can kind each of see there has, on the edge. Uh, if I remember, yes, each one has four of the full page part arts. Uh, and then they all have uh, the, the that's also in the Kindle edition. Yeah, you can, I think you can show them off. We tried to keep it like spoiler free. Yeah. Um, uh, so they're just kind of cool images that uh, I figured somebody might flip through them and just look at those. If they think the words suck, at least the printers are. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what I, I told. So anyway, let, let, uh, so Jason Michael Hall is a good friend of mine, and we work together. Uh, uh, in uh, I work in the film industry. We do something called previs, which is something no, nobody knows what it is, uh, <laughs> but it, it makes me fun. Anyway, uh, we worked together for a while, and he had done uh, graphic comic book, or uh, I'm blanking on the words, but you know what I mean. He did comic books in the past. Uh, okay. And he had showed me, he was doing some storyboards at one point as like a side thing. And he showed me, it looked like those though. And I'm like, man, that style is so cool. 
So I'm like, I gotta get him to work with me. And it, like I said, we were friends. So like at one point I'm just like, you know, it'd be cool if like I could bring you on to do some chapter headers. Uh, and that's all we were gonna do at first. And then it's like, yeah, that sounds awesome. He used to read old Conan books, which I guess had a lot of really cool, yeah, there you go. Uh, had a lot of really cool like art just like that and stuff. So he was like, yes, I wanna do something like that. And actually what's interesting is I just got an email right before this interview that uh, the Indie Inc uh awards just said that we are a finalist for uh prettiest like interiors and uh best illustrations and i'm yeah. like i showed it right to him i'm like dude this is your award you you earned this uh, would, would it surprise you to know i'm a judge on indie Inc? oh well <laughs> there we go okay so i so i uh you know cheated is what i'm saying <laughs> um, no, no. I, i'm i'm not involved in that part of the process i'm i'm more of the they hand me a stack of books and now yeah. i get to read those but Excellent. hopefully they don't hand me in the orbit of sirens because i can just be like well i already read it and i already <laughs> loved it well at least you could throw one in the fire keep you warm in the winter or whatever <laughs> you know people keep talking to me about burning books and it's making me concerned <laughs> It's really popular. Um, so one of the things I do want to talk about is because uh, when I did my review or one of my reviews, uh, when I finally finished the series, mm -hmm. I mentioned that basically this is felt like a story that you've been sitting on for years that you've been wanting to tell. And it felt like you were writing a love, lo a love letter to the story. I believe that you wanted mm -hmm. to tell was my exact words. Um, kind of where, where does the kernel or the origin of Song of Kamaria come from and mm -hmm. how did that come about? And like, what made you choose to decide to pursue writing the story? Okay. Yeah, that's a, that's got a, and I feel like it's an interesting answer, but everybody's going to turn out right now. Uh, but anyway, when I was a kid, uh, I was always fascinated in like space flight. Uh, and my dad had a bunch of old NASA books. And actually, it's cool because I still have some on my shelves that he like gave me after I moved out. And, uh, uh, and and right behind me actually is even like the Man on the Moon newspaper okay. from 1969, I think. And I have a nice um, little antidote to add to that afterwards. Oh, nice, great. Um, so anyway, I was in love with that stuff. And uh, as a kid in third grade who could barely do math, and that has not changed in my 30s, uh, <laughs> I'm like probably won't be in NASA or useful there. So what if I just start drawing really cool adventures and pretend like I'm doing it? Or whatever and that's what birthed uh something i called space explorers in my third grade class uh and from there you know it was just this fun thing i used to draw me and all my buddies uh we were just going on space adventures we were basically nasa astronaut suits and uh they had laser guns and stuff like that but over the years uh, eventually i got to like high school and college and i'm like i want to just create something and i just was thinking about all my old stuff that i used to do maybe i could start with that and like revise it uh, and I did that with Space Explorers, and it was called that again in high school. And then in college, I tried it once, one more time, uh, and I called it uh, Star Siren. And that's kind of like where the siren part of it jumped in. Uh, from there, it like kind of just, uh, I like it, it was another dead end, though. Like I kept trying to do it without planning anything, you know. Uh, and so what I eventually started doing was I tried to write a book. Uh, and it, it, you know, just going forward without planning again, I got like eight chapters in and I was doing kind of the wrong things. So it wasn't going anywhere again uh, until eventually one day I'm like, you know what? I can self pub whatever I make. So that's inspiring that anything I make, at least it can go out, you know, into the world. Uh, and but what I need to do is figure out an entire outline first, which is weird that it didn't occur to me sooner because every english and literature class i've ever taken in all my schools i got a pluses in and every essay i outlined first i don't know why i didn't think do that with a oh, book yeah. <laughs> you know, like just why am i plowing forward and why am i editing as i'm going so so with this newest attempt i make an outline i showed it to a few of my buddies just be like what do you think of this uh and my my one friend ty actually he's the one that suggested like i just had lung lock as like a blip it was just, they get there and there's lung lock and they solve it. And then he's just like, that's interesting. You should make that a thing, you know? And I'm like, oh, okay. So, you know, that became a giant thing. So from there I evolved this outline and then eventually got cracking. And then I realized, okay, this has got meat. It's working and it's, you know, good length and everything. And then I found out it's actually like, like, I don't know. It was like way too long. It was like 250,000 words. 
Oh, first. wow. Yeah, because I was going off of, <laughs> this is me just being dumb. Uh, I was not thinking of word count. I was thinking of, oh, word says it's 350 pages. That's about what I wanted to hit. You know, because like, <laughs> all the books I read as a kid were about 350 pages. So I read a good book. And then I mentioned like, yeah, it's this many words and stuff on Reddit. And they're like, you wrote a 700 page book, right? And I'm like, oh, Jesus. So yeah. Yeah, formatting. formatting. Yeah, exactly. You got to take that into account. And so eventually trimmed all like it got down to uh i think 145,000 words at the end of it which comes out to be roughly about 500 pages and that's a comfortable like it has, lets the story breathe you trimmed about 200 pages out of just orbit <laughs> yeah yeah and actually uh, uh another good friend you'll notice that so a lot of good friends of mine I'm, I'm from chicago so we always have a guy or something right so a good friend of mine uh what, I'm about uh, he, three hours south oh there you go okay uh so yeah we're, we're in we're indiana neighbors now oh okay well south isn't it <laughs> east i think southeast yeah okay anyway uh uh yeah so Terrible. i'm directionally challenged okay i don't know if you're <laughs> calling me out on hey i am too i couldn't figure out if i didn't have gps's i would, don't know where i'd be right now uh anyway so uh yeah another friend of mine at my current job uh he beta read for me and it was funny, it had gone through like six beta readers already at this point. And I'm like, yeah, I think I'm comfortable with it, but I'm unsure of part one. And this is the the last guy to beta read. It was like, dude, you should just start it with Eliana on Kamaria. That way we're there. You know, he's like, otherwise it's shoe leather until part two and a half uh, where we're not there. And in my brain, I was like, well, that was on purpose because I wanted you to like feel like oh, it's kind of like Avatar where you're like, you see all the gross you know, real world stuff, blah, blah, blah. And then the Pandora's amazing, you know? <laughs> and so I barely I to remember delay. that movie. I'm yeah, completely, yeah. completely honest. <laughs> no, no worries. But, but yeah, so, I, I was trying to save the reveal, but there, that, when it comes to a book, it's like, no, nobody wants to wait that long for the meat, you know? So mm -hmm. he was, that was excellent input and put it in. And that also helped trim out all the crud, <laughs> essentially. But yeah, no, it's a long time coming with this one. Fair enough. So you've been working on this for a long time. Uh, the the small little addition, and I never ever remember this about my own like per family history. Um, my grandmother used to pull out this box and set it in front of me, and she'd open it and she's like, "By the way, your grandfather was in Mission Control," and she's like, "She's like, like this is my moon rock," and <laughs> I never remember this until you were like, "Oh yeah, NASA." I'm like, "Oh yeah, my grandfather was." It, it's something it's like That's such a cool. piece of my history yeah. i never remember oh man wow yeah no no now you will <laughs> yeah, I'm glad now, I now it's just like, oh yeah that did happen wow. uh, <laughs> so basically kind of because we're about 13 minutes in we've barely touched on anything in the story now we're keeping this oh, non-spoiler sure. but you know basically song of kamaria is there is you know the, the very bad idea that humans continuously want to invent an ai machine Mm -hmm. and then make it walk and talk uh, mm -hmm. and have arms and appendages and then give it weapons uh, <laughs> is perpetually a bad idea. Mm -hmm. And of course, humanity go goes and done it. And <laughs> then done these, it again. <laughs> these, like Terminator wasn't enough of a warning. <laughs> yeah. This must be a world where Terminator didn't exist. <laughs> yeah. Right. I should so start 200 years. They've run humanity out of the soul system mm -hmm. and then we get to Camario, which is kind of like this last ditch effort of humanity to survive. And then we kind of go on a tale of survival and we do a nice found family. We introduce some alien species, uh, the struggle for survival and breathing alien air with one lock. And uh, there's just all sorts of great little elements that you've put within the story. And now that that's out of the way, and we may cycle back to it. I kind of want to talk about SPSFC. Oh, cool. Okay. Because that just concluded uh, mm -hmm. about a month ago, month and a half. I th yeah, I feel like it's been, you know, it's, uh, everything is like time dilated now. So yeah, right. Like, How was that experience for you? It was really cool. Uh, like I, when I first signed up for it, it actually, I just done a, an interview, like uh, us finalists all uh, did an interview uh with a different podcast and uh they had asked us kind of like how was it we all kind of said the same thing at first we we're like yeah why not do it it was free it was there uh we didn't really know much about it as sci-fi authors uh, except what kind of like what was bleeding over from i think it's sf 
B-O. Yeah, I, I just say Spiffbo. Spiffbo. It's there we go. That's perfect. Uh, but yeah, we, and we're like, that would look cool, so we'll give it a shot. And then, so when I first submitted it, it was like, okay, yeah, why not? I might never hear about this again, you know? Uh, and, and then seeing, like, uh, you know, as it progressed, uh, then you suddenly get feelings <laughs> towards it because you're like, you're like I, like when I got out of the, the I think it's called the slush pile in the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm like, whoa, OK, I, I made it a little farther. You know, if this is as far as I make, fantastic. And then I get into the semi, uh, the quarterfinals, I think. Uh, and I'm like, OK, now I got to check it every day. <laughs> <laughs> Time to check the uh, and then and then, you know, I managed to progress past that to the uh, I think it's just the finals after that. Right. Or is it semifinals? uh i, like I don't know i'm currently in, on team book invasion mm. for spf spsfc2 cool. and we're just currently in the slush slush pile phase i don't know okay. if I, I get carried past the slush slush pile or maybe past the quarterfinals or something uh, like that i don't know okay yeah so like what the farther you get in as an author you're you're suddenly now like invested and like i was checking like every 15 minutes at some points and stuff and just but what was cool beyond just checking stuff was being introduced to a lot of different like book bloggers and, and mm -hmm. reviewers and stuff and a lot of them are like really funny and a lot of them are everybody is like really good with the input uh like i learned a lot about my books and how to write better books just by being exposed to this stuff you know and it was just really cool and then you know we made it into the top five i was literally number five <laughs> yeah. uh, at the end of the day and i'm like this is fantastic and you know i what was even cooler too is the other authors that were in that that pool too i've now talked to and you know i I've, I've, I've bought a few of their books as well i tend to kind of buy more too uh, I have a whole self pub couple shelves in my office here yeah there you go i i if it was in reach uh, and you could, and I wasn't wearing pajamas on the bottom of this. <laughs> I would probably reach over and grab it. But yeah, I got the same book uh, and, and a couple of the other ones too. And it's so cool. And what's even cooler is now that I'm out of it, like I'm not doing SF. As, as, yeah, it's very hard to say. The second one. <laughs> uh, since I'm not doing that one, it's cool to see who I know who is doing the second one. Uh, and so I got like people I'm rooting for and I'm like, oh yeah, get going. Here's one right there. He's currently in it. Oh, there you go. Cool. Well, you know, good luck. <laughs> Grand He's adventure. right here. Awesome. Oh, I've seen you. Know, I've seen that cover around. So very cool. So bravo. <laughs> so we, we do have a question. We've okay. got a couple questions. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how did you pick what to cut? Oh, okay. Uh, so, so knowing my book was way too flipping long, uh, it became I, I would say the the biggest thing I figured out how to cut was from when my friend said you should start Eliana on Kamaria. That alone could, was an entire rewrite of part one. Um, and so because, you know, chapter for those who read it, I mean, even if you look at the, you know, Amazon look inside thing, page one, we are there with Eliana on Kamaria. It's very cool. Uh, yeah, and 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 uh, so it, which is way stronger because I think before it did used to start with Denton the way it starts now. Uh, his didn't change too much, but what was different was uh, him and Eliana used to meet on the Telemachus, and mm -hmm. uh, they used to like that was where they initially met. Then they all go into hypersleep, you know, blah blah blah. I'm not going to go too far. Oh, into okay. It. Um, but so now, as you know, they're on Kamaria. That all all that stuff was pushed into part two. Uh, so knowing to trim that, that really reshuffled a whole bunch of stuff. Other than that, I'm trying to think, oh, I did, um, the, <laughs> I'll, I'll say these cause these aren't in the book and, that, and, and you'll know why now that I knew my book was too long. I'm like, well, I can cut the stuff that doesn't work. Um, I had a Jurassic park kitchen scene, uh, where they were <laughs> in the jungle, essentially they're climbing on the, the colossal timberman, you know, the big, uh, the basically big walking trees with, they're kind of like, uh, daddy long legs or so yeah. whatever, depending on where you you live you probably call them something different uh but they're trees and so what i eventually had was the stampede goes through the middle of their legs uh and they would be climbing up and then there'd be the big uh basically t-rex thing would walk through and it would kind of see him but he didn't see him you know thing and i'm like we don't need this at all this doesn't <laughs> and it's just the jurassic park kitchen scene literally <laughs> legitimately so i'm not gonna do it uh yeah stuff like that you know like it was just little things that weren't adding to the story and kind of it was adventure, but it was not adventure that led to plot changes. Um, okay. So I, some of it got used in the second and third book. Uh, so I won't go too far into some of the other stuff I cut, 
but yeah, no, that was that was kind of how it was. Just a you know reread it. Anytime I got bored, I cut it. <laughs> you know, it's like so keep it flowing. You know. So. Well, you've got very good pacing and structure, and like structurally speaking, you, you kind of skirted around it trying to be non-spoiler, and I don't consider this one a spoiler um, because I like to know about structure when I pick up. Oh, a sure. Book. Yeah. Uh, where, you know, in part one of the first book, you've got two different timelines going on. And in mm -hmm. fact, you've got staggered timelines throughout the entirety of the book because you've got a character who's kind of off on his own uh, trying to survive out in the wild and avoid right. lung lock and do what he needs to do. But like the way his chapters are done mm -hmm. is it's like, you know, oh, it's been a day. Oh, it's been a week. It's been months. It's been years. Yeah. And, and I so when you follow his timeline, <laughs> it's very much that way. Mm -hmm. And I won't go into detail about it, but, and yeah. then in part one, we've of course start on Camaria with yes. Eliania or Eliana. I I've been say saying Elia <laughs> and I'll admit I Chicago up all the words I say. So yeah. when I'm working with CJ and uh, Michael Reimer, who did the audiobook for the first book, uh, mm -hmm. when I was working with them, I'm like, oh yeah, uh, you pronounced it this way. I've been pronouncing it this way. And he's like, well, you're wrong. <laughs> 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 and I'm like, and I'm like you're right, because I'm from Chicago, so we stress every A, every T, I think is a D. <laughs> you know, so it's like, I'm like, yeah, I'm going to go with, it. like, Telemachus. I was calling it the Telemachus or something. And he's like, yeah, I, I, yeah, I, yeah, in I'm my right. brain, it was Telemachus. Yes, and you're right. I was totally wrong when I started. And the same <laughs> with uh, Tabor. Uh, it's actually Tibor. Uh, so they corrected me. Every Tabor time. is? Uh, he's the leader of the Andreal. The, the kind of figurehead. Uh, he's only briefly in the first book, and then uh, I won't say Oh, that. okay. Sorry. <laughs> my, my brain, because I just finished book three, went to a different one, and oh, I was like, yeah. that's not his name. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so, yeah, there was, uh, uh, and I forget where I was going with that. But, yeah, no, uh, I think that answered your question. Okay. Right. Um, <laughs> and then where did the idea, uh, Kay wants to know, mm -hmm. Where did the idea for the sirens come from? And let's try and keep that one as non-spoiler as possible because yes. the sirens are yeah. very much a part of this world. Yeah, and they're they're kind of a, a little bit of a reveal, but I can talk about them for sure. I mean, they're on the cover of the first book. Actually, that's something uh, before I mentioned on the cover of the first before book. Before I answer that? that, if you look really carefully, the words kind of covered up, but uh, oh, it's really dark though. I gotta admit, I'll have to show you like a naked cover where it doesn't have any words on it. Yeah, this is really, or I'm also in a dark room though to try and keep the lights right. But anyway, one of the sirens is right here looking at the characters uh, on the book. And, <laughs> yeah, and that's actually a 3D model I made uh, that I gave to Daniel. And I'm like, hey, if you can throw this in there, because uh, now I'll admit, uh, before I answer Kay's question, I want to admit I cheated hardcore about the design of the sirens. I was, I was unsure if my description would be good enough so there is a chapter header that fully features what one looks like just to cheat and get that image in people's brains. Cause I'm like, this is the iconic image I want you to see, <laughs> you know? So you didn't, so I, you didn't I, go off of Cubone from Pokemon. No, no yeah. <laughs> that's definitely something I'm like, oh man. Cause I was a huge Pokemon fan as a kid. And uh, it's funny cause as I'm making the models, uh, the I've been making sculpts of a lot of the creatures. Uh, some of them I'm like, why have I seen this this exact color scheme before? And I'm like, that's because it's a Pokemon. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> why did I include the sirens? Uh, what inspired me to include sirens? It was, uh, I, as I mentioned before, I've been tweaking this story since like third grade. Uh, the only reason there are sirens in the latest one is because in high school, I called it Star Siren or college, I called it Star Siren. I had created, I called it that because it sounded cool. <laughs> And that's sadly as shallow as it is. It sounded cool. And, uh, you know, it works. Uh, yeah. I mean, it, but, but then, but it, and in the, in the, uh, college version, that didn't do anything. So when I started doing the outlines, I'm like, you know, it'd be cool to still use something I can call to homage to myself. I like to do that, even though no one catches it because for me, you know, uh, and, and as you see in the third book, I dedicated it to myself. Because I'm like, yeah, I did. I, yeah, I, yeah, that's that you know? like, my, my yeah. big hint that you were uh -huh. writing yourself a yeah, lot. I was writing, I was trying to make the nine year old version of me happy. So I included the sirens because they were kind of an idea that had been introduced in a previous iteration that I wanted to make work. And they looked dumb previously. It just looked like a human wearing a weird hat. Like, I'm like, this is dumb. That's why I wasn't working. <laughs> 
And so, the and then I can go. Oh, yeah, yeah. Is for Tommy Bruno, nine, nine years old and dreaming of adventures on faraway worlds. Thank you for waiting. You have arrived. Oh, you know, it's it sounds super lame, I bet, to everybody else. But, like, when I heard <laughs> CJ read the dedication for the audiobook, I'm like, yeah, I did, didn't I? <laughs> and I heard somebody read it out loud. I'm like, yeah, I did. I did this for me. <laughs> I made it. This is I'm great. Here. I'm here. I'm, I'm nine years old again, and I'm happy. <laughs> anyway, so I, the, sadly, the 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 short version of Why Did I Club? They sound cool. Uh, the long version is I wanted to make an old idea work. Milana <laughs> approves. Oh, cool. Happy. I'm happy that's satisfied. <laughs> so you mentioned your 3D models. Yes. Um. Basically, <clears throat> excuse me. Got to go my throat <laughs> real quick. Oh, With your 3D models, do you use that to kind of build what mm. you basically build the alien life that you are envisioning on Kamara, or is this just yes. a passion project? So, uh, and okay. actually, that's part of the origin of how did I make this book uh, that I kind of totally forgot until you mentioned it right now. So, I I went to college for computer animation and uh, film, and okay. uh, a large part of that was learning a program called Autodesk Maya. So I learned how to model. And the, the entire reason I even went to college for this thing was because I'm like, I want to tell stories about cool aliens and stuff. Uh, but the the best way I can't, I, like I used to be able to draw as a kid, but I was worried I would never be able to draw consistently. So I'm like, my brain was like, how do I, how do, I do this? Well, 3D modeling, you make it once and then you can use it a billion times. Uh, and that's literally what told me to go to college was that line of logic. And I did. And so I learned how to do it. And then as I was in college, I'm like, I should make, uh, a animated short, and that would be cool. So I started modeling all kinds of stuff, like the Octantis suit uh, that they all wear. It's kind of like, it looks a little like a, a NASA suit, but it's got a little more going on. Like it's got solar panels that are kind of also like armor and stuff like that. I was modeling all that well before I knew I was going to write a book, because I didn't think I could write a book, uh, which, which, you know, I don't know if that makes me sound like a bad writer, but I feel like a lot of writers actually say that when they start the first book. They're like, I didn't think I could do it. It seemed impossible. So I tried to do what I knew, which was create a animated short. So I modeled, you know, the Pilgrim spacecraft explorers and stuff like that. The Astraeus was modeled. Uh, Roland was modeled, actually. Uh, uh, the Dreva were modeled. Uh, they looked a little weird, but I made them better recently, as you guys probably saw on Twitter and stuff. Uh, so I had all these 3D models, and then as I was you know, suddenly I'm not in college anymore. I'm five years into my career uh, and I have this knowledge in previs, which is all about camera angles and working on Hollywood movies uh, and stuff like that. And I worked with a bunch of directors at that time and learned all their camera techniques and stuff like that. So I'm like, yeah, I can make a really kick-ass short now. It's going to look awesome. I got almost all the way to the end of it. It exists. Uh, it's a little messy because as I was making it, I'm like, there's a lot of story I could do here, you know? And so I, you know, I had Nim uh, modeled out and all the, the sirens were modeled. And, and that's the one that ends up on the, the cover and okay. uh, kind of was inspiration for Jason Hall to, to do the chapter header and stuff. And, um, and so, you know, I, I had gotten to almost the end of this thing and I'm like, I should write a book. I should just write the book. And like yeah. I cannot fit the story into five minutes, <laughs> you know, I'm like I was trying to like, if, if I ever released just the, the animated short, uh, which which is in the book, uh, but it is it's funny because it was originally in that first. This is another thing I cut out. Um, it was in the first draft of the book, like line for line, everything. And then I realized it adds nothing to the book, and it's actually better to cut it and like fade to black, you know, and then leave the audience going like, "What happened there?" You know, and no, pick it back up later. There's nothing wrong with fading to black sometimes. Exactly. Yeah. It, it, strategically, you know, and you do yeah, it. You right. gotta do it. You gotta yeah. you gotta be smart about it. Well that and as a as a book too, like you know, visually when you see an action scene, that looks cool. When you read an action scene, it has to do things that uh that like a movie's action scene doesn't have to do. You know, like a movie's action scene could just look cool and that's the that's the end of it. You know, like and, and at the end of it the hero wins or whatever, or he loses. Um, and in a book though, uh, a fight better mean something to the story. You know, every slash better actually affect a character, you know, it's gotta, it's gotta have. So when I had it in there, I just kind of like, I'm like, this isn't doing that. It was a movie in there. Therefore it does not work as a book. So, uh, yeah. Uh, so in, from there, I, so I scrapped that, wrote the book. Uh, and now that I've written all three of the books, I'm like, 
I'm like, I should go back and like make the models, you know, of all the creatures. I know what they look like. I did most of them already too. Uh, yeah, for a I, while you were sharing a ton of them on Twitter. Yeah, yeah, and I, I was cranking those out. Like those only take me about a day to make. Like uh, I really? was getting really impressed with myself. Yeah, I was like, well, because I've been waiting for you know I, in the past when I was making them uh, in college and stuff, and even like through Maya, it was more complex because you have to like use a mouse and keyboard and strategically move vertices, and then then you have to un- anyway. It's a big process. Um, yeah, on the lately, what I've been doing, the things you guys have been seeing, uh, that's on my iPad, and it's a thing called Nomad Sculpt, and I just it's just like sculpting. So if you know what you want to make, you could and and you know how to use the program a little bit. I watch like two tutorials, and I'm like, yeah, I mean, it's similar to other things I've used. So I, I did have a little bit of knowledge in like how to make it work and stuff. But yeah, I'm like, yeah, I can create these out pretty quickly, and I'm thinking I might make like an uh, an art book type thing that's like a companion to this trilogy. Or just like, oh, you want to know what a you know a bully bulk looks like? Here's what kind of something bulk like looks like. like this. There you go. LL McCree's got one. I had heard like about an this. Expanded I companion it. guide. Oh, perfect. Yep, exactly. Like and that. she she does something like that, and it's 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 super short. Yeah, exactly. It wouldn't be very. It'd just be kind of like a you could put it on your table. Just, just a little extra. Uh, exactly. Yeah, it's just got a little lay like, that on is, there. Yeah. <laughs> 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 exactly. That's that's exactly what I think I might do. Uh, so we'll see. But uh, you know. I, I, I'm excited to see how that turns out. <laughs> and it's All super right. fun. And that was probably a super long answer to like a quick question. You know what? I don't, I don't even mind. Um, <laughs> one thing I want to I wanna talk about, and it's mild spoilers, kind well, of. I'm okay with uh, hooking people with, like, the, you know, well, let's do it. A bit. It's about representation. <laughs> okay. And I, I specifically remember starting on the Winds of Quasars, and there was mm. representation that meant a lot to me. Yes. And that was Soul Sign. Mm-hmm. Now, what made you want to include Soul Sign within this trilogy? Oh, sure. Uh, so, uh, sign language. I have been seeing a lot of my favorite stuff uh, has has uh, people using sign language in it. Like the the newer Planet of the Apes movies uh, did it really well, uh, and some of the other. I, I hate to say cartoons, but that's kind of the best word I got for them. So I've been seeing it more lately, and I'm like, I want to have a character who um, kind of... So the dynamic in the cast is family is very similar to the dynamic in my family growing up. Okay. Um, I don't have a deaf person in my family, uh, but we do have someone with special needs uh, who can't speak well. Uh, his name's okay. Danny. Actually, I, I, I uh, the dedication to Quasars is to my brother Danny. And okay. so I wanted to show that dynamic uh, in a way that I found interesting. And I also kind of wanted to learn more. Uh, and through including it, I reached out to a bunch of people in the deaf community. And uh, it was awesome. Like, it's a culture, you know? Yes. It's it's so cool. And I was honored that they would give me the time of day. Oh, absolutely. Uh, and, uh, and Triva is the deaf consultant I had. Uh, and her parents, she was raised by parents who are deaf. And uh, she just basically, she is Nella. Like, she helped me make Nella a really great character and i am so when i when i like look back on it i'm so proud that that's in there because i'm like i can't believe i i wrote that you know and 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 it's just an interesting character you don't see enough of you know and i wanted that oh well i'm I'm glad you think so (laughs) i i worked very hard to get that because there is some of the early notes i got i learned a lot uh and i'm so glad that you know, people seem to like Nella and and all the other characters too. There's a few characters like June and uh, uh, um, in the third book there were there were almost a few more, but that sadly that scene just wasn't adding too much, so I had to cut it. But if I ever do like an extended edition, there are more. <laughs> yeah. the, author, the author's preferred edition. <laughs> yes, exactly the one, the long one that I wasn't sure people would read. <laughs> I would love to do a director's cut for a book. I don't know if that, I think it's called abridged, right? Or unabridged? There's I think a word. it's unabridged, yeah. Yeah, yeah. A- like abridged that. would be shortened and kind of right. compacted. There you go. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, I, yeah. hopefully that's, that's a good enough answer. But yeah, I mean, it's just, yeah, in the dynamic and their, uh, the cast is families. It's just something I know, you know, from experience. It's, it's not quite exactly the way m- me and my family was, but it was mm-hmm. something kind of near and dear to my heart to have that kind of family in, in, I don't know, in my sci-fi world. So, yeah. <laughs> um, speaking of, uh, you mentioned something like culture. 
which made me think of Ganymede and, and things of that Ooh. nature. And so like, you know, when we're with, at the start of the first book, we've kind of separated out and humanity has spread throughout mm -hmm. the soul system past, you know, beyond Earth and to many of the moons. And the Cassis family is on Ganymede. And then, you know, we've got people on Earth and we've got people on Mars and they don't quite get along. We've got kind of some cultural clashes and things of that mm -hmm. nature. And one of the things I thought was interesting that you did is there is you phonetically put in accents into mm. some of the way that the characters speak, uh, kind of preserving Earth culture, even though these people aren't from Earth. Right. And I kind of wanted to touch on what gave you that idea. Uh, OK, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I wanted to I still wanted people to, like, have their original cultures. You know, like I, I felt like, you know, in, in a lot of sci fi, uh, you know, take like Star Trek, for example, or whatever, they all join the Federation. They all just kind of become basically humans wearing different hats. Yeah. Um, and uh, and so in my world, I'm like, I wanted to kind of like uh, not only make every colony feel different, but have a cultural different. Uh, you know, there, there are people on Ganymede dude, that aren't exactly, you know, uh, from what I would consider the South, <laughs> you know, like, cause they have kind of a Southern accent and everything yeah. uh, and everything. And then there's, uh, you know, Callisto, they have more of like a Scottish Irish accent, uh, stuff like that. And I felt like it gave not only the characters, their own background heritage, uh, mm -hmm. but it made the colonies a character as well. So it's just like, you know, you can, it, uh, Callisto is a terraformed moon. Uh, so it's different from Ganymede, which is not terraformed. It's right. only like Ganymede only got this like little, pimple of a colony on it and then they didn't have funding to do the rest of the, the whole moon and again if you know uh, about getting it it's one of jupiter's largest moon i think it might be jupiter's largest moon I'm uh, so they got me. screwed <laughs> yeah and so, and so i wanted them to be kind of a more backwater kind of thing so they're they're smart but uh they have their own way of like talking and doing things and so it's you know they don't have to explain everything they just know how to do it and uh and stuff like that and then callisto they're more of like a garden moon uh, as I said, they were terraformed a minute ago. And so they're more like nomadic. They live outside. Uh, that's why when you meet Fergus, the, one of the first things he tells Denton, he's in the first book. No, no worries. <laughs> There's a lot no, of, I was just like, lot Fergus. of Fergus. Okay. <laughs> and Fergus is just a minor character in like the first book. I think I love mentioned. Fergus though. He's great. And honestly, the way CJ does his voice, I'm like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and michael too michael did a great job with his voice too but like when i heard cj do it i'm like wow that's it it almost sounds like i wrote this <laughs> you know it's like some other guy wrote this i'm sure um but yeah no it was it was uh yeah that was the main reason though uh, i just wanted to make not only the characters have a heritage but the the colonies they come from are characters now okay because um, they have a shared you know kind of vibe to them so. well fair enough so one of the things that, you know, I, I'm now just literally as we're speaking, questions are popping into my head. Sure, yeah, and right. one that just popped up is Denton is not your stereotypical protagonist. He is not this macho hero. He is somebody who has stuck in the family business. He's on this backwater moon and basically the apocalypse happens and he has to flee where he gets an opportunity to be put into a new situation. But that still doesn't make him this macho hero. It, he's a mechanic. He yes. fixes things. And I like that aspect. And what it makes me think of is Dead Space. Mm -hmm. um, the video game. I got game a funny there. thing about that, by the way. You mentioned Dead Space. Uh, should I say it now? Or <laughs> did you have more? I didn't want to cut you off. I just... No, no, go ahead. Oh, okay. I'm, my name is in Dead Space 2. I won a contest. And uh, if you go, to, if you're aware of uh, Dead Space 2, there's a point where you go to like a daycare. If you uh -huh. look above one of the doors, there's like a scrolling marquee that says the Tom Bruno Daycare Center. So I didn't get to choose where my name is. <laughs> I'm like, I'd rather it wasn't there, but okay. It is oh, one of the more I, memorable. You know, I did not even know that. So that yeah. that's a nice little. So there's a little, little action for you. <laughs> that, that's really sure. cool. But basically, like, I mean, he is just a mechanic. He's fixing, mm -hmm. you know, when everything goes down, he's in his family's shop. And I just felt that that made him more relatable than, okay. say, this epic space adventure, Mr. Captain on the bridge of yeah. the Enterprise or whatever. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. No, I get, I get you. No, I, yeah, I, I wanted to write. Uh, well, I, it was one of those things where you write what you know. I'm not a mechanic. 
necessarily, <laughs> but like uh, I am an artist and he's also an artist as well. So that's kind of, it's like he was born into a family that didn't have a lot of like, uh, there's not a lot of opportunities on Ganymede. So he's right. just going to do what his parents did and what his their parents did before them and stuff, which is work in this machine shop forever. But he's actually an artist, which I am. So I'm like, I wanted to write like a guy who doesn't really, he's kind of stuck in a situation. And you've heard this this line before stuck in a situation he wants to get out of blah 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 uh you know so therefore but um i also just wanted to write something that was a little different from all the other sci-fi i was reading uh so it's like you know you have master chief in halo and stuff like that he is and i also don't know the military that well so i didn't want to try and know the military that well so they're in it for sure like and, and i have respect for the military for sure uh but i wanted to focus on a character i could understand so I can explore kind of Camario through them vicariously. Through the scouts, because uh, you agree yes, that exactly. in the military, you do a scouting kind of service. Mm -hmm. Yes, which yeah, and there's only you get a to few, go in. you know, people that are escorting the scouts to, for safety. Those yeah. would be the only, like, you know, like the uh, Vashtar Marines or whatever, which are really cool to me. Uh, but they, yeah, and, and so I wanted to, I, I was just, it was a confidence thing for me and just an outlet to help me explore a world. Uh, that I'd been, you know, obviously crafting for a long time. All the animals and everything, the creatures that lived there came before the story. So I'm like, well, how do I get to explore this world? So I'm like, all right, then. So <laughs> like, here you go. <laughs> so yeah. Okay. Now I have to ask this question because I have to. I have to know why did you make the? And I'm going to butcher the name. The Endural is how I pronounce it. Oh, that's way different. <laughs> so terrifying. <laughs> The Undriel, is Undriel. how I've heard it. <laughs> no, that's fine. I'll take it though. Uh, I just again, that's another question that like I wanted to make robots that were uh, different from what I was reading. But you can only you know if you start with robots, they can only be so much different. So I'm like, so how do I make these like my thing? Uh, and and also just playing with sci-fi tropes. So like I you know I have humans uh and the, actually the way the flow of the books goes each one of the books kind of focuses on one of the three uh you know like things we're introduced to so book one is humans book two is the Ock Knight. book three is question marks so i'm not going to say um but anyway i probably already they can, you probably already figured it out uh, <laughs> but anyway uh uh so the undreal i wanted to make robots that were scary enough to get rid of humans out of the soul system uh and they had to do things in a way that sounded believable so it's like if you're going to take over the soul system you better believe it's going to happen uh and what they're doing i mean it made sense to me that they would absorb people uh everybody compares it to the borg i've not seen one episode of star trek with borg in it i i hate you see to i think it. cybermen from doctor who yeah yeah that too. now that i have seen uh, I don't remember them absorbing people, but I, you know, I, I was kind of, I was late to Doctor Who and also uh, out early. Not that I don't like it. I just like, I, I love David Tennant. And then I just stopped watching when <laughs> I'm like, I can't He's handle this. Back. Yeah, yeah, apparently. So I'm like, okay, cool. For a little bit. Uh, for a little yeah, bit. Exactly. For a little bit. Yeah. So I, I wanted to make, is, but the way I'm under the impression, the way the Cybermen and the Borg uh, assimilate people is a lot less violent. So I'm like, what if I make it so that, okay, I, you know, I can't avoid them. They, I want them to absorb people, but how do I make it different from, uh, you know, like these other things I've seen? Well, I'm like, well, what if they got like a chainsaw for like a chest? And what if they just pull people through it? And it's like advanced enough that it knows what to keep and what to just saw out, which is horrifying. And, you know, sorry everybody if there's gore uh but like, you know so we uh, i did that uh and then i also just kind of combined robots with insects because insects are another big sci-fi trope you know you get like starship troopers and stuff like that so i'm like how do i uh, i would love to do that because i love bugs and uh i'm like how do i can combine them i have not really seen that before uh, and it gives me a way to describe these weird things easily so I can say like, oh, this character, you know, it looks like a wasp kind of, and then go farther into it. So they're not exactly like a wasp or anything. And I also wanted to give them cloaks too, just to make them not look so Terminator, you know, uh, and that also is, and, but then, you know, anytime you do this is you're creating a character, you're like, why is it wearing a cloak? It's not cold, you know, like, and is it, like, usually the function of a cloak is to keep you out of the rain or the elements or you're cold or something like that. So I'm like, well, it's wearing a cloak because it has a whole crap ton of, stuff going on underneath yeah. the quilt that you cannot see 
Uh, so it's got guns, it's got blades, it's got you know multiple cores that would be vulnerabilities if you could see through the cloak. Uh, but since you can't, that's that's why they were. Um, but yeah, I just want a really scary robot. <laughs> yeah, there's there's one aspect. Whenever whenever it was you mixing the bugs with with the human uh, aspect, I I can only picture Toy Story um, when they go into the bully's room and he's been like yeah. mingling and he's yeah, taking the creepy. baby's head and like you know you what know, I'm that's... talking about. It's got like the oh, one yeah, eye. Yeah. And just... Oh yeah, and I'm not, I'm not you're not totally wrong. <laughs> like that's that's pretty close. Just think that, but like more horrifying and taller. <laughs> There you go. You're good. You got it. You get the gist. <laughs> All right. Oh, so before okay. we get into spoilers, I want to talk about the self-pub process. Sure. And I just yeah. kind of want to kind of pick your brain on how that went for you between edits. We already mm -hmm. we already know you've you've trashed 200 pages yeah. um, <laughs> of just the first book. So I'm assuming the other two weren't quite as beefy. No, the other two were more straight. Well, actually, no. I take it back. <laughs> Uh, yeah, you reminded me of the of a horrible thing. Uh, uh, well, I could I could say this does not spoil thing, but the character Cade uh, mm -hmm. in book two is not the character Cade that was written in draft one. That is a main character that got an entire rewrite between drafts. Oh, so wow. yeah, very different character. Everyone hated him, and I'm like, <laughs> oh, that's not good because he's like the main character for the next two books. So I better like figure out how to make this guy likable and luckily I, I think i pulled it off like I, I liked him way more the second time around uh okay it, fair enough it just yeah because he was just like it was i was trying to do something i'm not good at which was make a hateable character eventually likable you know like uh um uh, i'm under the impression i haven't really seen all of it but uh, better call saul i understand I think okay. that's kind of the vibe where he's like he's you know you kind of don't like him but then you start to feel like you like him and stuff i was trying to do that but i didn't get that second part <laughs> so it's like i just had a character everybody hated reading about and they're like i wish he dies you know and i'm like okay <laughs> that's, that's the brutal beta reading process that you need as an author by the way i take that and i i read it and i go thank god you told me because i was going to publish this book with that guy in it and i did not now uh you know if it means work it means work but you know i've been i've, I've got to used to getting a lot of criticism so i can form it you know and i like mm -hmm. that um but yeah as far as self-publishing goes uh 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 the first book yes was the most in depth because i just didn't know what i was doing um as far as like the publishing side of it goes so it's like i wrote it and then obviously i cut a lot of it out because i figured out i was not even analyzing my own writing right by reading you know it turns out words pages mean nothing and it's just all about word count uh and that was a big lesson for me that day i'm like well at least i wrote too long of a book and it's harder to <laughs> it's easier to cut than it is to add you know like yeah. if you're sitting there adding you're like well now it's filler you know that's literally what filler is um so after that uh you know it went through multiple rounds i edited it myself the first time uh for book one uh seven times uh just to and it, what the problem was was i was editing a book that wasn't really ready for an editor and I shouldn't have done that. You know, like I thought, oh, I better go through this a bunch of times. But what my process now is for books two and three, I would say that I've solidified what my process is. It's write the book, uh, do one edit. Uh, so go through, you you know what the book is now. Uh, you know, so you go back and you make it sound like you knew what you're doing the whole time, which is a Neil Gaiman quote, but I took his masterclass and that is a rock solid advice. So you edit it one time and then you give it to a bunch of beta readers. Uh, you can hire some, there's a couple websites if you want. That it, uh, honestly, the higher, the ones you can hire uh, are great because they don't know you. So they are not, they are not afraid of hurting your feelings. <laughs> boy, oh boy, <laughs> but you need that. Like you need, uh, like I hired three people uh, and one guy was absolutely brutal, but I used his advice and I feel like it was one of the, it was kind of like a hate edit after that, where it's just like, oh yeah, you didn't like it. Well, maybe look at it now. <laughs> you know, you know, again, yeah, it was better for it. Um, so after beta reading, you know, I do, I take all their notes and I, you know, I figure, and I, by the way, one of my beta readers always is my mom. Uh, and oh, okay. the, I call it almost the most important pass is the mom pass. Uh, cause my mom does not read a lot of science fiction and she was gung ho to read this. Right. So she was, she, I'm her kid. So obviously she's like, I want to help you. And she was the best beta reader 
But also what's great is since she doesn't read a lot of sci-fi, it helped me keep it like understandable for people who don't read a lot of sci-fi. So it's like if I can get my mom to understand this easily without having to do a lot of homework or, you know, know the tropes offhand, then I've made a book that's like got wide appeal, you know? Um, yeah, it, yeah, it definitely for me fits in that kind of space opera where you've got this yeah. great story and adventure going on and there's kind of technology in the background. Like right. there's sci-fi stuff going on and they yeah. use sci-fi implements, but they're not like, by the way, the way this blaster works is if you yeah. pull this lever yeah. and you it insert this charge, it creates this electrical field and it exactly. doesn't require all that. Yeah. And, and honestly, and, and the part of that comes from my film industry experience too. It's like, we don't sit and explain how a rifle works on movies you know like you get it you point it and it shoots <laughs> so I was like the only thing i say uh is that the collider technology it could pull just anything out of the atmosphere around you even if you're dead in space or something that like that me could, mass effect. yes exactly and so it doesn't need to be reloaded it can just always grab energy and they just reverse engineer that from the underrail bada bing bada boom we have our energy source you don't need to know anything more about <laughs> you know it's like it's like we don't need to worry about reloading how much ammo that they have how does this work you know I, we cover it and it works, you know, as far as I'm aware. Was, um, anyway, so yeah, mom pass. Uh, uh, I take all the beta reader notes. I edit it one more time with their notes in mind, uh, fixing mm -hmm. anything or anything like that. Uh, and then from there, I want to say I have my mom read it one more time <laughs> just to make sure I like didn't make it more confusing. Uh, and then from there, it goes to a real, uh, real editor. Uh, and they, you know, they, they give me all their notes and we fix everything. Then it goes to a proofreader uh, and they make it all dot all the I's and cross all the T's and stuff like that. Make sure it's all nice and ready to go. Uh, and then uh, th during that process, Jason Hall is working on my illustrations. Uh, so we, we're working. I'm basically constantly working. Anytime I'm not doing something, I'm doing something. <laughs> if that makes sense. Like when I'm not working on the words, I have another thing I have to do where it's like, okay, talk to Jason. Like, oh, he has questions about uh, what does this look like and what should we do here and what are your ideas and all that stuff. Uh, and I found too, uh, so for book one, I was kind of like really hands on with the image I wanted on the cover for Daniel. Uh, mm -hmm. And I found that I should just not, I should just be like, <laughs> Dude, here's here's a vibe, and you, you roll with it, and then and then after we work out the vibe, I go okay. Here's how it could work in the book as a scene, you know, and then we we whittle it into something that is in the book from there, because uh, that's what book three is. It's just I'm like oh, yeah, 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 I, I had an image of a book. cover for book three. Oh yeah, right. yeah. If you have no reference for the series, you have no idea what's going on. Yeah, it just looks awesome. scary because the other two. Here, I'll hold up the other two. The other well, two it also nice, gives you the nice vibe. This is. <laughs> if these are kind of like blue and white, and then all of a sudden you've got red and black, and be like, oh, yeah. maybe this book's a bit darker. Yeah, this book's going to get scary. And it, what I loved is everybody, all the people, you know, on the book tour I did and a couple other things when they pick it. And I think you too, when you picked up the, the third book, you're like, this book scares me. And it <laughs> should. <laughs> and I, I'm like, as soon as I heard that, I'm like, nailed it. That's exactly what I wanted to hear. You know, like, uh, and I wanted people to be afraid to start this book. Uh, and because uh, they care about everything and they know, you know, with the ending and how the second book goes, <laughs> it's a little, you know, anyway, I won't go too far into that. Uh, I, I think that answers the question. So we have the art, we have all the proofreading, all that stuff's done. We put it all together. We get a higher formatter. Bada bing, bada boom, format is the last thing that goes. And then it just goes on. A, I put it on IngramSpark.com and uh, Amazon. Uh, those are the only two I use. I, I tried the first one. I tried to go wider with like draft to digital and stuff. And, and Ingram is your printer, correct? Uh, both, both Amazon and Ingram are my printers. Um, oh, so, so you, I oh, gave okay. so you did yeah. like paperbacks through Ingram and the hardcover through. Well, Amazon? Ingram does both because they have wide appeal. Uh, okay. So that's why you can get like uh, the Broken Binding uh, dot com for the UK people. That that's there because of Ingram. Uh, oh, okay. So I gave Ingram wide rights. I gave Amazon. Uh, narrow rights. So only Amazon can, you know, they're going to do just the paperback and the ebook, uh, but they can only sell it on Amazon, which is not against any rules with Ingram. Uh, it's just as long as both are wide, that's that's uh, the thing. So well, yeah. I, I did not know that about the industry. So you yeah, just... I, I took like, so the cool thing about Ingram Spark is that they offer free classes about how to use them and mm -hmm. how to just, and, but you can use this information almost anywhere. 
Uh, and, and I just, I also read a few like legal handbooks of like, just to make sure I'm doing everything right. And, you know, don't, somebody doesn't just take the book and run off with it, you know, or anything like that. So it's, it's, it's all locked down. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's all locked down. It's, I have a, an actual business and stuff like that. I, I filed for DBA and all that stuff. Um, so it's legit and it just took some doing, <laughs> but yeah, the, the, the Ingram Spark's great. If anybody's like wondering where I got a lot of my information, it's, they have their, uh, free courses. They're like 20 minutes a piece. Um, and they just kind of teach you just everything you kind of want to know. Uh, and I highly recommend just knowing a little bit of that before you publish anything. Um, cause there's some people that just kind of throw it on the wild and they're like, well, why isn't anybody reading it? It's like, oh, well, there's ways to, you know, make sure it gets to people. And then after that, it's marketing, which is a whole different, you know, that's marketing. Word of mouth. <laughs> Yeah, and luckily, I with my film experience background, I can make trailers, I can make art and stuff, I can promote it in a lot of ways that not a lot of authors can do. So I use my, I use all my strengths as much as I can, you know. So yeah, that's that's the process. <laughs> all right. Well, before we head into spoilers again, um, this weekend, the third oh, yeah. through the fifth, in the orbit of sirens. Let's ha- it helps if I hold up the correct book. <laughs> and it's free on ebook on Amazon uh, internationally. So make right sure now. you pick it up if, of course, you're watching this live show within those three days. And if you're not, pick it up anyway. It's on Kindle Unlimited. You have no excuses. Right. And if you have Kindle Unlimited, you can get the audiobook for like $8 more. I think so yeah, why not? Like awesome that, narration. Yeah. But uh, yeah, fantastic trilogy. We are going to start moving into spoilers which I'm sure everybody's going to stop watching. And I don't care because now it's my time. Yeah, no, that's (laughs) fine because I've been wanting to talk about spoilers forever. (laughs) No No one has asked me about spoilers yet. (laughs) So I'm going to go ahead and throw up a spoilers badge. And uh, yeah, basically, if you have not read this series yet, we are going to talk spoilers, especially book two and including book three, because how dare you? Uh, (laughs) George uh, Washington shows up in a spaceship. (laughs) Yeah, right. It was wild, right? No one asked me about that. Crazy. <laughs> that does not happen. <laughs> um, no. So, you know, one of the best relationships I've read in a long time is between uh, Denton and I'm going to say it wrong again. That's why I say everything wrong. So it's... Yeah, no. <laughs> Eliana, Denton and, really is it Eliana? Eliana. Just, just Eliana. Why do I keep adding an I? <laughs> Eliana. Okay, Denton That's and Eliana. I, because I, I like I the way be they wrong too, come together. Way. Because she is still grieving for what she assumes to be the betray- the mass betrayal of oh, yeah. her father after getting possessed by Nim. And I like how Denton kind of comes in and just kind of reinforces and holds her up and does this very supporting relationship. He doesn't force it. He doesn't push it. He doesn't move too fast. And I think one of the best... I mean, of course, there's a the whole sci-fi, you know, elements, and you've got like the transforming creatures that like they've got to set wards against, like all that's really cool. There's a great found family for readers to identify with here, and I love that you nailed that in the series. Oh, thank you. I'm, I'm honored you love that. That's awesome. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, uh, <clears throat> you know, it's just I wanted to write character. So uh, one of the themes of the first book, at least. Um, was just like, I, I wanted to uh, answer the question of what do people do after loss? Um, right. So everybody in the book loses something. Uh, and we're in spoilers now, so I can just, I can mm-hmm. just say it. I You're good to go. Able to do the, there's a whole, there's a whole little thing on the screen. Had. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, Eliana loses her family. Uh, Denton loses kind of his path in life, which is, you know, not as strong as family, but whatever. Roland loses his soul for the most part. All of humanity loses their home. Uh, the sirens themselves lose, like their, in, you know, kind of their, their entire identity. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so everything, everything's just losing something, and everybody reacts to loss differently. Um, so right. I wanted to explore that from all these different angles all in the same book, and and that's kind of what you get. Some people react negatively. Uh, you know, it's not it's not always healthy. Like Nim is very unhealthy with the way she reacts to. Uh, just everything that's happening to her within the book, 
uh, and and uh, Denton's a little more healthy about it, where he's you know he's lost kind of his way when he shows up to Camaria, and they put him in almost an identical machine Situation. shop, and he's like, oh my god, I thought this was going to be different. <laughs> And so, uh, and so, therefore, he's like, "Well, what do I do? What else would I do?" And you know, and luckily, he meets Eliana, and she, you know, he's been seeing these scouts go out and they fly off in the space. He's like, "That sounds awesome," you know, kind of thing. But he's never had an outlet for it, so he's got a he's got to work to get to where they are. Um, you know, it does It's not just handed to him; he's got to earn it. Uh, and then, you know, Eliana loses her father, and she's, you know, kind of uh, swirling in depression because of that, because it's violent. And traumatic um and that was another thing in my books i wanted to do is like anytime almost anybody dies it's never just like oh he died okay move on you know uh it was like it, they're they're thinking about it later like even in book two which since we're talking spoilers uh i'm saying again real quick three two one okay when yeah. when private ken simmons dies uh he's literally just like in any other book i've read he would be a red shirt you know you right. barely know their names or anything like that Denton Mr. is Rado thinking Mr. about Rado. how he watched that guy die for almost the rest of the book, you know, and which is horrifying. A guy gets like ripped up by horrible vine things in the, the wreck of the Telemachus. Um, so, yeah, that was kind of what I was exploring with that. But then it's also kind of how loss can bring people together, too. You know, like they they complete each other in a way. And I like the compliment of uh, Eliana is a doctor. Uh, so she's a field medic as well. Uh, but she's also a scout. So a lot of people have multiple roles. Uh, like George Tanaka is a biologist, but also linguistics. Uh, I think everybody had at least two roles because they originally they were two separate people. <laughs> and, and again, that was another thing I trimmed out. I smashed people together. And I'm like, okay, how do we make this shorter and more concise? Um, but yeah, uh, so uh, yeah, they complete each other. She's, you know, she works with people. He works with machines. So they together they can do anything. Apart, they are very limited. <laughs> so I think later, I think in book well, three, you, can, you kind of address that because when yeah. when you separate them in book three, uh -huh. they are very much just lost. Yeah, they need they like kind of need each other again, you know. Like and uh, uh, it's especially Denton because he's like at that one point where he has to figure out how to get the serum and the uh, the anti venom. Uh, some some soldiers had been stung with something that uses old earth venoms, but we haven't seen earth in like 600 years. So where the hell are we going to fix this? You know, uh, unless we ask the Undrill very nicely for an anti-venom, they will not give us. Uh, so he's kind of out of his element. And if Eliana was there, she would have been right on top of that. But he needed to like kind of use what do I know, you know, to get through that. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, it, yeah, I, I just like that dynamic. And a lot of it was uh, uh, kind of organic as I wrote it, like uh, I start with plot first uh, in setting, and then I throw my, so, you know, like you hear people on Twitter, they call it like pantsing or plotting. Mm -hmm. uh, I call myself a gardener where I, you know, plot out the land and then I see what grows. So it's like, okay, here's the land. That's the plot and the, the setting. And then what grows is when I throw my characters at it, what do they do? You know? Uh, so it's like, we, I know where they're going to go and what has to happen, but how would Denton do this? How would Eliana do this? You know, Cade and Nella, all very different people that have very different approaches to a problem, you know? Um, so yeah, that's, that's well, a long answer. <laughs> going even further, I want to know who your favorite character is, who you absolutely mm -hmm. messed up. Who I absolutely <laughs> messed up. Because uh, nobody is safe. No, nobody's safe. Uh, oh, so which character do I like the most that I killed or hurt? Yes. Okay, specifically, Hrunda. And I really wish I didn't kill her. <laughs> she was, somebody had said, like, I understand why she needed to die. For the record, Hrunda's in, uh, uh, for her spoiler words and everything, uh, she's in On the Winds of Quasar. She's an Auk now. Uh, she kind of looks like an owl, uh, just to keep it short. And she's this beautiful creature that like lives in the wild. We get to learn more about Kamaria. Oh, yeah, they, she saves them, takes them yeah, in. Oh, I'll take, take you make home. Tea together. It's gorgeous. It's just so beautiful. And then she gets her head smashed in with like a hammer. And I'm like, oh, that was so violent. But I needed the the bad guy to be more of a problem. And he needs to win. Because if he just shows up and gets his butt kicked every time. He's not threatening to me at all. You know, like I, I'm a big proponent of my villains need to win more than my heroes. Otherwise, the villains are not good. Because, uh, and you know, in Marvel, it's like, or, or you know, like other superhero properties, like uh, Fantastic Four is a good one, I feel like. They're always facing one dude, and there's four of them. 
And I'm like, he's going to lose. <laughs> like, and, it, and the minute they show up, they whoop his butt and it's over, you know? So I'm like, okay, so how do I make my villain scary? Well, the Undreal are introduced in book one and they win. <laughs> you know, they, yeah, they are seeing them win. Yeah. They are then winners for two books. Uh, and then in book book three, sadly, again, spoilers, I, I'm nervous to talk about it because, like I said, I haven't done this before. Book three is all about the Undreal, and uh, they are winning almost the entire time until Auden is making bad decisions because uh, he's getting too cocky and just things are interrupting his, you know, uh, way of his, his strategy. Was, was a masterpiece oh. because, A, oh, I love you. how the Unreal are there on accident. Yes. Yeah. Like they it's, want to, they're, they're done with humanity. They're like, well, they were, you, well oh, yeah, at, at the end of part one of the first book, mm-hmm. and then you specifically put the line, and then there was silence, and they seem content. They seem happy. Yep. Like, shoo, get off yep. my property. Yep. I'm gonna go be crotchety inside I'm my house. Do my thing now. Yeah, and we and no one's aware of what that thing is until you get to book three, and you're like, there was no thing. <laughs> there was no thing. Yeah, uh, things just, didn't quite work out for them in the they system, too, and they also, got there first. Yeah, yeah, they, they got there first. I like that. It was funny because one of my beta readers uh, it was my buddy's dad. Actually, he was he was awesome. Uh, just as a beta reader, I loved his notes. Like he caught. Oh, by the way, so in book one, uh, it doesn't uh-huh. really happen in book two and three. Uh, almost every side character is named after a real person I know uh, yeah. because I was just like, you know, again, I was writing book one. I didn't know I'd ever write more than one book. Uh, and I'm like, I'm just going to throw everything I got at this. And then when people liked it, I'm like, I should write more. <laughs> everything I got more story to tell. Uh, I, I like, I want to write three, but I, I'm going to make sure one is satisfying is what I was getting at. Um, so he he caught every person I had, you know, uh, alluded to in it. Anyway, uh, shoot. I, now I threw myself off of the question. Uh, yeah, your buddy's just, dad. He was talking about, oh, yeah, he was like, oh, you know, you should allude that the Undreal are like on their way to Kamaria at the end of this or something. And, I, and I'm like sitting there in my head. I'm like, I already know what I want to do with them. And I'm like, <laughs> and I ran that idea past him. Uh, and he's like, he's like, oh, yeah, that's way cooler. <laughs> he's like, so, yeah, you can't mention them again after part one. <laughs> and I just wanted them in book one also, too. They were just kind of like a. Uh, uh, the thing that every person was worried about, like in the back of their minds, none of them left the soul system, you know? So yeah, that was, that was just my big thing with that. <laughs> yeah. So basically just in book three, cause I mean, a, we do the time jump and we start kind of following Cade and Nell yeah. in book two, which is, you know, Denton's kids. And mm-hmm. I, 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 my <laughs> mouth wants to add the eye. <laughs> oh, to Eliana. <laughs> no. I'll let you do it. And and like I said, I might be saying it wrong. I could no. be. Feel um, free to correct me. All right. All right. I'll, I'll Elena. My fist down. Elena. <laughs> Eliana. Eliana. <laughs> all right. Eye, you have an eye. There is an eye in there, but it's yeah. There, right there, there was eye. an eye in there. I can't. <laughs> I I can't not pronounce that eye. Uh, anyway, but basically, I love that we jump like twenty years, and then all of a sudden, like the book starts, they're in space, and you're like the crap is going on why are they mining rocks who's Cade and you're just like yeah "Yeah, I love that and then like you know we go on this whole homeward bound adventure I don't know if you even know that movie I do very much I've never heard it called that one yet but that is (laughs) yeah it's fitting it is yeah Uh, it's it's a fitting adventure yeah Uh, we we, we do the whole homeward bound thing but then Uh like you actually do the thing yeah. Cade. You, yeah. you actually did it to him. And I was girl. like, there's no way. He's yeah, no one, no one expects me to be that mean. And it's funny because so so here's the object the objective with book two was I wanted to know more about the Arknai, uh, and I wanted to see more of Kamaria because we followed the humans so closely that like it was, you know, it was we didn't we were in their walls a lot, you know. And, and like I said, I kind of if if people played StarCraft, you're aware that like Starcraft 2, it was split into three parts. Uh, mm-hmm. The first part's about humanity and like the human characters. Second part's about the Zerg, I think, or was it the Protoss? Either way. And then the third part's about the Zerg or Protoss, whatever one the second part was about. I did the same thing. Uh, so book one's humans, book two's Arknight, book three's Undreal. Um, and, uh, uh, but by doing this, um, you know, I wanted to have characters that travel across kind of the world 
as we as we know it we see new things we make the world bigger uh, it's got a little bit of like the jurassic park 2 uh and which i know is like not cool to say because not, not a lot of people like the lost world but i like lost I, world i don't like I do too. it's a great it's a movie where you get to see people get eaten by dinosaurs a lot more than the first one and they're a little bit smarter anyway uh <laughs> and then the recent attempts uh uh but anyway uh, i haven't seen so, one of the movies so i don't know yeah so I so what's funny is so my objective was that for book two, uh, but as I'm writing book two, I'm like you know it'd be really cool to like have a character who has been absorbed by the Undreal, and like knowing what that's like, like being on the inside of that. And as I'm writing book two, I'm like oh crap, it's Kate, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and again too for another big spoiler in book two, when we got to the moment where Auden runs into Eliana and the people she's with, right? Mm -hmm. uh i knew that event would happen like again this is the plotting pants and gardening thing uh i knew that event would happen and i knew somebody was going to get it bad there and Maybe. i wasn't sure yeah but i didn't know who would be in the car at the time i just wrote down one of the people there does not make it out of here and and when the scene shows up they're in the car and uh you know eliana's calm cuts out and everything and i go oh crap it's fake I'm like, she's been through so much though. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> for a little bit, I'm like, do I not do it to her? Because, but I'm like, I, I, you know, I don't want to do it to Jess because I need Jess for book three. And uh, you and do just, do like, it to Jess later. Cool. Well, yeah. <laughs> she gets stabbed through and tossed to yeah. the lake. Yeah, she does. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that too was unplanned. I was like, not totally sure what I wanted to do with Jess in book three. I just knew I needed her in book three. Uh, well, and I think that was a smart choice because after Faye gets absorbed, if Jess had gotten absorbed and been like, okay, fine, everybody's going to get absorbed. Yeah. And instead yeah. she like refuses to like accept perfection. Yeah. And he's like, hey, you can save her or you can just let her die. And she's like, eh, nah, maybe just let me die. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. She gets, she goes out the way she wanted to, you know, like, yeah. uh, on her terms. Uh, uh, yeah. So it's like, and, and uh, it was cool too, writing that scene in book two where they finally like run into an Undreal. Cause I don't, it, that's the first time most people really see a, a land based Undreal. Uh, I was noticing in a lot of the reviews, they're like, yeah, they were chased out of the solar system by sentient spaceships. I'm like, not quite right but that's all i've shown you so i can't blame you for thinking that so i need to show you what they really look like is like a land-based thing it's like a humanoid kind of figure thing but is that scary. why you included sentient spaceships in the third well book? they can be kind of whatever they need to be and since we were in space uh they would needed to be spaceships you know <laughs> so, so like the, the, so therefore they were but it, essentially it's a suit like there's nothing on the inside of the battlecrafts uh, mm -hmm. just all machine. It's a little bit like, well, not quite, because uh, uh, if you're familiar with Battlestar Galactica, eventually they take one of the Cylon ships, and I'm like, in my world, you wouldn't really be able to get inside that thing. Uh, you can get inside the big ones because they got to house more troops, you know, but you can't get inside the, like, personal battlecraft thing. Uh, so that's why they're there, but yeah, they weren't necessarily, like, and that wasn't supposed to be the vibe. It was supposed to be more like what Tibor is, uh, where he's, stand he's the figure, and he's standing on the front of the Devourer the first time you see him. And, uh, uh, you know, that's the real version of what they're going But nobody thought that I was doing that. <laughs> like, I, I love how the, the reveal at the end of how Auden goes down. Yeah. And he's yeah. just, and they, they were like, hey, you're a puppet. And he's like, no, I'm going to in control. And they're like, hey, <laughs> he's like eh, not quite. <laughs> not quite. Your you AI you got the better of you. Yeah. And you just liked that about it. So you let it, he, like, he's, he's a, a very aware that, it's happening, but he won't tell himself that, you know, it's one of those things that like I, uh, villains, in my opinion, always think that they are the, uh, you've heard that before. They're the good guy. Uh, I also wanted Auden to feel like he was the victim this whole time. Uh, so he's, that's kind of, and that's like the last line you get out of Auden as basically as Kate is smashing his head with his fist. Is that just like, he couldn't help but feel like he was the victim this whole time. And it's like, this dude, <laughs> You know, basically ended the soul system. Billions of lives are gone. But at the end of the day, even his last thought is like, why is this happening to me? You know, <laughs> which is what I feel in, in real life. I feel like villains do that where they're yeah. just like, why is everybody being so mean to me? I was doing the right thing, you know? Uh, so, yeah. No, no. <laughs> well, and so speaking, because, you know, we talked, we kind of touched on the sirens earlier. Nice. Yeah. We should talk about that more. Um, but you like the, the time travel aspect 
and the no. way so in the first book i was like oh that's kind of cool the way you utilize that in book three yeah where they're trying to figure out like where's the corruption coming from mm-hmm. and yeah. oh okay okay <laughs> I mean, yeah just... so in book one uh uh again so the books are sci-fi fantasy so mm-hmm. uh i also just wanted to have in my mind, it was the the fantasy part is what other people called it. Uh, in my mind, it was like no, I, I feel like a smarter person than Dented could probably figure out the biology behind why this is happening to him. It's just something we don't understand. And so when I picked, when I was like doing sci-fi, I'm like, well, I want these characters to run into something like humans can't process. And I'm like, what do humans currently can't process? Is like ghosts or something like that you know right and so the the sirens were kind of that approach where it's just like they're uh you know supernatural in a way uh but i was hoping it wouldn't come off as like totally magic uh it is something they're built to do and by book three i hope it's clear exactly why that works but i'm i'm honored to now be considered sci-fi fantasy it's just when i was writing it i was thinking I'm like well how do i make like how cool would it be to see a supernatural thing in a sci-fi thing? Because it's like you got these guns, but how do you fight something like that with guns? Um, and so the the Voyaltin is you figure out their real names in book three because I was sick of calling them sirens because people were like, are they mermaids? And I'm like, no, they I mean I guess they should be. <laughs> but I guess the, that, but they're that not. Another bargaining <laughs> moment where, What's that? where the Voyaltin only come up in the third book was they're renamed essentially in the third book uh what? so it's the same things but the, i just gave them their real name in the third book mainly okay. because i didn't think of their real name when i wrote the so, so that was something that <laughs> very much you were yeah okay it's the third book they're not sirens anymore here's right. the origin story and actually that that's uh, if you'll allow me to d- divulge a little book three as i was writing it i'm like what how do i keep everybody busy and keep it interesting and keep the audience our readers like learning, you know, like, cause I didn't want anybody to just be like, Oh, he's doing this. And it's the same thing every time, but no, what we're learning uh, through Denton is kind of how the war worked in the past where it's like, you know, humans get a leg up, then Andrea will get a leg up. And it was always just a war of like, I think it's called a war of attrition where they're yeah. constantly outdoing each other. Uh, you mm-hmm. know, and, and that's, what's crazy about it. Uh, but then I needed, I'm like, well, what are, what are Eliana and Nella doing? And I'm like, well, Nella, you know, she's tapped into this vein of uh, the siren lore, essentially, through the nether forms and stuff like that. I'm like, I might, I should make her learn more about them. Because there are things, I, you know, through beta readers and just people talking about the book with me, they had questions about the sirens that I wasn't answering. And book two doesn't have a whole lot of siren stuff in it. Um, so I'm like, yeah, maybe she's the one that's like, her path is like the Voyalton path. You know, where mm-hmm. we learn they come from a, a you know, a, a planet that has no star that exists near a black hole. So they're kind of phantoms on that world, uh, but they have a way to become physical. So that thing you're seeing in the first book or two, it's not really a dead body. It's actually more like a spacesuit, you know. Right. Um, and so but it has to grow through this goo stuff, which that's from uh, Carl Sagan's original run of Cosmos. He had, uh, I was watching it as I was like falling asleep on my couch one day. And at one point he talks about like, this is kind of the same ingredients that were uh, irrelevant on earth when, uh, before life began, essentially. He's like, if you shock this enough times for like millions and millions of years, eventually you're going to get life. And I'm like, what if the inside of a siren or, or for Alton ship is filled with that stuff, but it's kind of like quicker or they just have that much time that they can, they can, make stuff come out of it you know my brain that, tells me you're talking about primordial ooze yes that's pretty much the <laughs> gist. yeah and so like i have it so they can they can rapidly you know make that work faster and stuff like that um but then since we have a su- supernatural on it the reason the voyalton or denton can even do a shade walk in the beginning is sadly half of it has to do with me just wanting to keep the reader engaged and not just doing a flashback because that's mm-hmm. kind of what it is functionality wise it is a flashback Um, uh, but I wanted, I'm like, it's not quite a flashback if a character, if a main character is involved in some level. Right. It kind of turns into an investigation style. Yeah. It's like you're seeing a moment and you have to grab information from this to use in modern days, you know? Uh, and so from there, now I had the shade walk and one of my readers, my, my friend, Matt, 
uh, he was like, he's like, oh yeah, are we gonna know more about that and everything? And I said, yeah. And in my brain, I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but then by the time I got to book three, I'm like, oh yeah, no, we could do this. And so yeah. Kate's path is the Andrea path. What happened on this in the soul system? How do we ever stop something like that? Uh, and like the, you know, we get more about the corruption and it turns out they're not all one thing. They're like two different things. And in theory, I could go down that path as like a, a continuation story or a prequel technically. Uh, but I don't know if I would, cause I feel like you get enough information through Cage's journey, you know? Uh, well, so. and you also through the, um, through the, uh, Arbiter, <laughs> am I, am uh, I thinking the Decider? Um, Oh, the decider, yeah. The decider, Which his name almost was the arbiter, and the only reason I didn't go with is because of Halo. But <laughs> yeah, um, so the decider is just like, oh yeah, that they're the Unreal are not the only ones who have done this. Yeah, like we don't we don't let these people join our network, and you're just yeah, like, they just punched in. Yeah, they just punched in, and I think he's he makes a line about like yeah, it happens a lot. There's a lot of things out there that think I'm primitive, <laughs> you know, and like everybody's like, oh wow, okay. Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, and actually, that leads into uh, my brainstorm recently was I might do an adventure that kind of goes through the universal web of planets and like, but there's, you know, there's all these rules with it that I've set up. Uh, but I would try to write something that like, you don't have to read these three books to get that. Um, you just can start here if you want. I could maybe be an adventure. But yeah, no, I you could uh, totally do just a travel in the web because, you know, you yeah. set it up where it can be one way two-way someone gets trapped exactly way. yeah yeah exactly you go out and then maybe you want to come back but you can't you know yeah and uh or you know maybe you get stuck in a different world that doesn't do that or something like that uh so yeah it, it could it's a good playground i feel like uh but i wouldn't continue with these current characters I'm, i might have Cade just like in the background of a shot or something like that i feel like that that was kind of my goal with the epilogue uh if you want to talk about that was like i i know i'm done with these characters uh, but I want people to take Cade with them. You know, a little part of this world that you could just travel with. He's yours now, you know, where it, maybe he's in the background of the next sci-fi book you're reading. You know, <laughs> it's kind of that open-ended and everything. Do a, like do a Where's Waldo? Yeah, kind of. Yeah, it's like, you know, it, it, part of that is the, the film industry background I have, where if I were to make a cinematic universe or something, I would Quentin Tarantino in Kate into the background of a shot or something like that. Uh, so yeah, that was, that was kind of like, you know, and and Stanley he, cameo in the MCU. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so it, it just be kind of cool. Uh, but yeah. And, and he, you know, he eventually becomes like everything we've talked about because he is an Andreal was a person can hear the song of Kamari like the Ock nine, you know, so he's, he's all of them. So. Well, and he mostly gets his human form back by the yeah. very end because, you know, they've, taken technology far enough with working with the Ocni, which um, I, I feel like we should touch on the Ocni before we end here. Sure, sure. Um, because the Ocni, we haven't really talked a whole lot about the You're Ocni. right, yeah. We've done, I've, usually they're the, the big subject when I kind of skirt well, over. Well, it, it's hard <laughs> to talk about the Ocni without going straight into spoiler territory. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. The fact that they're telepathic and that, you know, you can't really lie to an Ocni, um, but you can get away with it as long as nobody <laughs> decides to ask the question. Right. Yeah. You, and you, so you gotta work because, really hard. <laughs> yeah, like work really hard at it, yeah. which is where we get Toluo and um Magro. So right. what? Magro from book one. No, uh the one who had his wings ripped off. Yeah, that's well Tolulo, but yeah, I, I thought you were gonna say about the Magro stuff in book one where he manages to lie to everybody, but it involves like a chemical, you know, yeah. like he's, he's using an insect that he's chemically altered <laughs> to do it. So it's not like he could just go around like pump, you know, he had to convince himself, uh, never reveal that and chemically alter a bug to hurt someone else <laughs> into convincing his whole people that there's a lie about. Uh, yeah, no, that was, that was, I, cause I, 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 I wanted him to lie, but I didn't know how to like, <laughs> like, how is he going to do it? I'm like, well, he's got to use like his own weird science to do it. So. Well, and they're, I, they're more technological, technologically advanced than the humans. Right. Yeah. Um, they constantly like can adapt technology and mm -hmm. come up with other things. And they feel like they're the rightful owners of Camaria. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, they've been there you know, not before the Violton, but, you know, after the Undreal. Right. Yeah. They're kind of and more the just... natural uh, thing that lived on Camaria, as opposed to the Voyalton they landed there a long, 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 long time ago. Um, I, 
I kind of love the whole journey you take with them, you know, because <laughs> we meet them and we've got the tentative first steps in yeah. the first book where uh, I'm going to say she, you know who I'm talking about. <laughs> I know. <laughs> you <laughs> know. <laughs> uh, where she gives him the, the I'm just going to call it a collider pistol. Yes, uh, that you nailed it. I mean, that's, how, that's <laughs> literally what it's called. I, I read so much that I'm just like, I know yeah. what I'm talking about. Yeah. But I don't remember if it's specific to this story. No, you got trying it. Yeah. To point across. Yeah. Uh, and then, like, you know, we've got that kind of first relationship, first contact. Then we get the betrayal. And then, of course, we get that random Aknai who gets kind of converted. He's like yeah. the first conversion. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in Lark. quasars but then we get the broken trust with the dead god yeah which that whole god thing was was i think that was probably my my least understood element oh yeah okay mainly because it is the it is very specific to their culture mm -hmm. and we don't really take time they were just like yeah it's this is animal we worship and i'm like okay i'll just i'll just leave it there <laughs> yeah and sad, sadly you're, you're kind of right maybe i should have gone farther into that um, but yeah, it's basically they they worship a living creature. Uh, it's massive. It's it's called the Donnerin, and uh, it it they get a little bit of power from it. Uh, like they're allowed to do that thing in the first book where they can kind of seek track things mm -hmm. uh, by using like chemicals and stuff to kind of. Uh, it's almost more like they have to make themselves vulnerable to the Song of Camario. Are you talking about the uh, thing where they put in their eyes and it's yeah, and there's like smoke and, and stuff, and, it, and some of the humans are like, he's getting high, <laughs> you know? <it's> kind <laughs> of like that. Yeah, again, they have to chemically alter themselves, uh, but the way they're doing it is to make themselves kind of, uh, in my mind at least, I never like fully go on and say it, uh, is that they have to be uh, weakened uh, and sensitive to the Song of Camario to actually perform that. Um, so they have to, you know, basically burn their eyes a little bit, you know, weaken and all, and all that stuff. Uh, and, uh, and so, but they, they kind of derive that from, uh, you know, feeding this giant bird that can kind of pulse out that sound, that, uh, frequency, I guess you could say. And, uh, but yeah, they, they, they find, they kind of worship it. One of the ideas that actually kind of came from my, uh, twin brother, Dave. Uh, is that it is like, oh, maybe there should be a creature on Kamaria that's kind of like, uh, you know, we have like apes, you know, they're kind of like humans and we evolved from them. And I'm like, oh, yeah, maybe there should be like another creature that potentially they evolved from. Uh, but then I'm, I actually went in reverse with it. I'm like, what if a daughter in is more like a second step for an Aknai, uh from there? But anyway, yeah, so it's a it's a creature they worship. Uh, they, they revere it a lot. It's almost like every time there's one born, that's a temple now. You know, so they can go there and, and they bring their their one big thing is that they bring they, their they feed them dead. their dead. Yeah. And, and then and I also want that was another thing I wanted to do is like, OK, they have this ritual that people would find revolting, uh, you know, but they find it sacred and beautiful. Or it's like this this they bring dead bodies up a mountain and they let this giant bird eat them all winter, basically. <laughs> and, then the, and then the bird and it's funny because the bird doesn't really it's a bird like this for all intents and purposes, it's bigger. It's maybe it's smart in its own ways, but it's not like actively part of their civilization. It just eats the things they bring them and gets really fat and makes more eggs. Um, and uh, yeah, so while it's eating, they go and make a donor and staff, uh, which is kind of like my version of a lightsaber. I wanted to have something that as a, as a nerd at heart, like, oh, this would be the thing I can make, you know? I can go out and make a, a, my own, like you go to Disneyland and you get the, you can make a, a lightsaber. I'm like, this is my lightsaber thing. Uh, so yeah, that's why they're all different. And then I felt really cool like giving Lauren like a daughter and sword instead. I'm like, that sounds cool. Like when you're writing book two, you just, you're just like, you you take the words you know and then you're like, daughter and hook, daughter and sword. <laughs> <laughs> and then you're like, daughter and the halberd, you know, like, kind of like that. Like maybe they don't need to just be hooks; they could be whatever. Uh, well, yeah, you I, kind of incorporate it, and it tells the life story and things of yeah, that nature. Yeah, it's very. I, I just loved everything that you put within the song of Kamaria, and I am so appreciative that you not only provided me with copies of it, but that you wrote the story at all. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad it's received. You know, it's one of those, like, as I said, when I wrote the first one, I'm like, I'm just going to write this, you know, I want to write it. It's for me. And I'm going to throw it at the world <laughs> and see what they do. And, and it got a good reaction. And then and I'm so honored that anybody is reading this thing. You know, well, like you, it was, it was, it's a dream come true. 
you know. I, I'm pushing it as much as I possibly can. Yeah, thank you so much. Your support's been awesome. <laughs> well, we are approaching an hour and a half. And so just to close, again, I'm going to 100% say please pick these up on ebook, audio, physical, all three, if you are insane like me. And I mean, Orbit of Sirens, fantastic. On the Winds of Quasars, great cover, fantastic book. And if you want a gut punch and you want to hurt yourself <laughs> and a yeah. good into a fantastic tale at the threshold of the universe, all written by the wonderful Tommy mm. T.A. Bruno. Oh, oh, you did it. <laughs> <laughs> you did that thing. <laughs> you had me right in the heart. You got me right back. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, thank to. you for having me. This has been awesome. Yes, I this really has been absolutely it. wonderful. I cannot wait to read whatever you write next. I can't either because I don't know what it is. <laughs> I'll be just as surprised as you. Must, I might be a little more surprised. Mm. <laughs> All right, with awesome. that, I'm going to go ahead and end the broadcast. So everybody, if you're watching this, please, again, pick up these books, support indie authors. Uh, have a great time. Peace out. Stay magical. Bye. <laughs>